Hello, art historians. We're back with our next section of video. Uh, this is our uh, quick mini lesson on post-impressionism. Um, and so what do we have to do? We have to start with what the title is. Post meaning after. So after impressionism. This is a response to impressionism. Remember we talked about impressionism being about um, the need to show light um, and the need to show color. Um, and uh, the ability to paint on plein air. That's not to say that our post-impressionists didn't paint on plein air, but one of their big things was they believed that impress impressionism, excuse me, they believed that impressionism lacked emotion, um, that they believed that impressionism was too focused on just light and that art needed to be about more than just light. Um, they believed that art needed to be more spontaneous. They believed that art needed to evoke strong emotions. Uh, they believed that art needed to be sort of um, pulled from your memories and your feelings. And it can often be um, subjective. Um, what you see and what I see are two different things. And so often we will paint what we feel or what we see um, with like quotes around C, uh, they're usually more spontaneous. And we're looking at vivid colors, sometimes unnatural colors, sometimes arbitrary colors that don't seem to make sense. We're talking about really thick paint, which is called impasto. Um, we're dealing with sometimes distorted forms. We're talking about painting what we feel instead of what we see. And this is as a result of what? Photography, very good. All right, so this is not one of your guys, but this is Toulouse Lautrec. Okay, so this gives you sort of an idea of what was I talking about, sort of these odd colors, the odd lighting. Um, it, it definitely pulls on emotion. It's not just about how the light, it's about how you feel looking at this. Um, and we're going to cover uh, two of the most uh, famous post-impressionists. Um, and then uh, we're going to cover somebody that sort of jumps the gap over a couple of them. But we're going to go to, whoops, sorry. We're going to start with uh, Starry Night uh, by Vincent Van Gogh. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about what we see here or about who Van Gogh was. We have to really think about Van Gogh. Um, we have to think about the fact that um, Van Gogh suffered from mental illness and um, a good portion of his art is influenced by that, uh, by that mental illness. Um, uh, he suffered probably from bipolar disorder, uh, schizophrenic disorder, some kind of um, disorder like that. He also um, probably had lead poisoning, which uh, is bad for, very bad for your brain. Um, and um, he drank a lot of absinthe, um, which is also very bad for your brain. So he really had um, a lot going against him. Um, uh, he was, uh, he suffered from severe depression from a young age. Um, and um, in 1888, um, he tried to set up an artist commune um, with another artist, and it didn't go well. They fought a lot. Um, there was a lot of tension there, um, and that led to the two of them getting into a very bad fight. And um, and and that's where we get the famous uh, story about Van Gogh and his ear. Um, Van Gogh was in. Um, a rage and a violent depression. Um, he cut his ear off. Um, and then he spent uh, a year in um, a mental institution at Saint-Rémy. And that is where this painting was painted. And that's why we sort of have to have a little bit of background here. Um, this is very different from a lot of his other subjects. He did a lot of uh, still lifes. He did a lot of portraits. Um, we're going to talk about what we're looking at here. Um, he wanted very much wanted to paint a night picture. Uh, he, he loved 
um, the way that the sky looked at night, the way the stars looked. Um, but what's interesting about this is this is a, what we call a, a composite painting. Um, the, this is not the actual view from the um, from the window of his uh, asylum room uh, because the church that you see here in the town is Dutch. Um, Van Gogh was from uh, the Netherlands. So um, the church is Dutch. Uh, the trees here are Mediterranean, um, much Southern, Southern, Southern um, France, um, even down to like near, uh, yeah, like uh, along the, um, I'm getting there, uh, Mediterranean. And then the, 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 these are like the French mountains, so uh, northern France. So that well, we call it a composite picture. You, you couldn't actually look out the window and see these three things together. He pulled a piece from here and a piece from here and a piece from here. Um, and so what we're looking at is um, a, a piece that is an attempt to um, paint from memory. We're very used to artists painting from observation. Um, here we get into painting from memory. It's less important to paint exactly what it looks like, and it's more about what um, it feels like. Uh, Van Gogh himself said it was an exaggeration. Uh, he described something about it being sort of like an extended observation about looking at the night sky over a period of time. Um, uh, now, with our modern vocabulary, it's almost like what we would use uh, he was trying to create almost like a time lapse photo, right? He was trying to to show the way that the the sky moves and the sun and the and the stars and everything move in the sky. Um, we have these really beautiful uh, colors that are uh, like contrasting the green and the blue and the yellow um, really pop out against each other. They're very compelling to look at. We're looking at very short brush strokes, you can see them here. Um, we're looking at very thick application of paint um, in places and, and canvas showing through in other places. Um, that's what that dark spot is there and there. Um, that's what this is here. Uh, that's where you can sort of see the canvas coming through. Um, this is a wonderful mixture of um, observation, um, invention, he creates it, um, remembrance, memory. Uh, it's a really beautiful, you know, mix of those three things. Um, he, he wanted to paint his feelings. Um, he was working through a, a lot of things here um, and he was trying to express them. And so you you can see, and what people get confused about sometimes what they're looking at, um, this is a tree, it's called a cypress tree. Um, I'm gonna show you, oops, sorry, that's the wrong way. Um, like this is his brush stroke work, right? So this is a, a cypress tree. And, and when we're looking at, um, oh, let me show you, you know what, let me do one more. Um, this is a cypress, this is also a cypress tree, okay? So this is that same kind of tree, right? but it's, this is that tree at night, okay? So it, a lot of people think it looks like fire, um, looks like you know flames reaching up to the sky. Um, you see what is, uh, it's the wind, right? So we're getting perceptions. We're getting like the glow off of stars, um, like the, the halo around the stars. We're, we're seeing the wind. Um, you can't see the wind, so we call that when we're, we, we mix our, um, our uh, senses together, we call that synesthesia. Um, he, he is painting, you are seeing something that you feel. Um, and you really do get here um, the brilliance that is Van Gogh, the, the brilliance that is painting what you feel, the brilliance that is um, painting with emotion, um, the, the, the beauty of, um, you know, it becomes basically the foundation for our next unit, which is expressionism um, and surrealism. We're not quite there, but he definitely did say that it is an exaggeration um, of what we see, but it is very much a painting of feeling. This was done largely in a studio because he was in the asylum, um, but he uses 
you know, he painted a lot of things while he was in the asylum. Um, it, you know, there are, were people who said uh, after coming off of the, the Impressionists who agreed that the Impressionists lacked emotion, but there were people that said that this went too far. Um, that it it was too emotive. It it pulled on too many emotions, um, and that was that was Van Gogh. That's what he did. Um, his father was a pastor um, and uh, was a very difficult man to like, and so you see that that painting of the the church there. Um, and this uh, the cypress is actually a a symbol for death. And so you sort of see a lot of this dark imagery, but also a lot of this really beautiful light imagery. Um, so Van Gogh really was one of those people that helped bridge that gap between um, impressionism and what ends up being called expressionism and surrealism. Um, and he was really um, popular among some of the painters at the time, um, not popular among uh, purchasers uh, or collectors uh, until after his death. Uh, but then after his death, it was really uh, very clear that he was um, incredibly talented. Um, and you can see that thick impasto where the, the paint is just so thick on the, on the canvas that it stands up off there. But you can see also those quick, short brush strokes mean that some places the canvas shows through. Um, and you can see that attempt to make that like pulsing light with that, the yellow and the green and the blue just sort of popping off of each other. Um, they're really beautiful. And you know this is some of his other work, um, just a straight landscape. Wheatfield. Um, this is Dr. Gachet, his his psychiatrist at the um, asylum, um, who was himself also a very sad man. But you can see sort of the the pieces of the the um, canvas from beneath. Um, and then uh, this one is at the National Gallery of Art in D.C., so you can go see it anytime you want. Um, and so. Uh, uh, you can just see the thick impasto here. You can see the the brush strokes down here. Um, just really this idea of of painting with um, emotion, painting with um, attempting to pull emotion. Now, when I said that he was in a terrible fight with another artist, he had set up what he was trying to call an, an art commune in a little building called the Yellow House in a city called Arles, A-R-L-E-S. And he invited a fellow painter, uh, Paul Gauguin, to come and live with him. And Gauguin was the man that uh, was living with Van Gogh um, uh, at the time that Van Gogh had his, um, his breakdown. Um, Van, uh, he is partially responsible for um, some of the difficulties that Van Gogh went through at that time period because Gauguin is a self-centered, um, not a very kind person. And so, um, you know, he was really rough on Van Gogh and um, it was Gauguin that he was actually fighting with the night of the um, famous ear, ear incident. Um, so what's interesting about Gauguin is um, Gauguin was a stockbroker and then he moved to Tahiti um, in 1891 uh, to 1893. So just after his stay at the, the Yellow House with Van Gogh, um, he moved to Tahiti. Then he went back to France uh, for a couple of years. And then in 1895, he moved back to Tahiti again and stayed in Tahiti until his death. And so um, what you see here is um, a, a monumental painting, but huge, that's the word we use, monumental painting, um, that was painted in that second round of living in um, Tahiti um, when he left his wife and children, uh, stopped being a stockbroker and moved to Tahiti um, uh, to, to live there and um, to paint. Um, so we see a lot of things going on here, um, and we need to talk about sort of what we're looking um, at. So we're looking at a huge painting, 15 feet long by six feet tall. Um, it is a, a painting in three pieces. Where do we come from? So what is our past? What are we? So our present, and where are we going? So our future. Um, 
it is um, it's an interesting um, painting in that it has a lot of symbolism, which was also a really big piece of uh, post-impressionism is the idea of, of things being uh, symbolic. It really becomes a big deal um, in expressionism, the idea of symbolism. Um, but there is a, a good portion of symbolism in post-impressionism. And so what you see is um, what is uh, Gauguin's largest work that he creates in his lifetime. Uh, Gauguin believed that it was the greatest work of his lifetime. Um, he, he suffered from bad health. That's what made him move from Tahiti back to France the first time. Excuse me. Um, and, you know, he, when he moved back to Tahiti, the second stay in Tahiti, uh, he suffered from bad health. Um, he was obsessed with the idea that he was going to die. Um, and he really felt like he, he needed to, to paint this monumental piece that tells the story of life and death and birth and the afterlife and all that stuff. And that's what you see here. Um, it was painted over the course of a month, um, so the end of December into January. And um, he he believed really that this was was this was it. This was his big thing. And and what you're gonna see is there's odd pieces of people being out of proportion um, and there are odd like um, it's a symbolist work so you have to sort of interpret what you're looking at um, it he once said that he wanted you to be um, reminded of, of ancient frescoes uh, and so it is meant to be read from right to left um, so where do we come from um, we we see an infant here um, and uh, a young mother and her husband, right? So a, a young couple. Um, and this is, you know, our past. Um, back here we see um, what are some important uh, figures that seem uh, like they're looking back, right? They're, they're looking back into the past, okay? In the middle, here we see, you know, this figure here standing up, picking the fruit, right? We're in, in the middle of life. Um, we're picking the fruit of life. Um, um, he often called it picking the fruit of the world. Um, and, and in the foreground, we really have like a lot of really positive images. In the background, we have a lot of sort of negative images. And as we move over, um, you know, we had an infant and now we have a small child, a young woman and an old woman. Um, and then in the back, we have what is called the blue idol this is representative of the beyond the life that comes after our life. Um, and um, we also have in the back what appears to be a garden jungle sort of thing. And when we see the, the sleeping child here, um, and we see these women talking. We see, you know, our, our movement from youth to teenagehood to middle age to having children of our own to being an old woman, right? So we watch um, the the life sort of uh, go along from from right to left, um, and that is where did we come from? Who are we? Where are we going? Right. Um, and then when we're looking at it, we also see this idea of the four figure in the front. What are we? Um, is this idea of like that? It's much larger because we, we worry a lot about where we what we are, who we are, what we're doing. Um, but it's really also important that we see this figure here. Um, and this figure here, there, there is a, a reference to to the Aztecs, to um, the ancient Peruvians, um, so the the the, um, the Incas, uh, because there had been a, a Peruvian mummy uh, exhibit in Paris just before uh, he went to um, Tahiti, and so he was influenced by sort of those ancient burial traditions, and so we see you know, this infancy, you know, the young love, teenagerhood, um, and moving into some of our older age and, and, and you know, what's happening with us and where we're headed. Um, so again, the foreground is, is 
good, like closest to us is good, and the background is is scary and un, unknown. Um, there are also some figures that seem to pop out at us that kind of look a little bit frightening that maybe don't look quite as frightening when we pull away, but that almost looks like a scary face. And so, um, you know, Gauguin was all about trying to paint, um, you know, the, this grand cycle of life. Um, and, you know, he believed that he he did that here. Um, so, you know, the, the symbolism of our, our youth and our middle age and our our, go, our, our journey from being a child to having children to being an old person um, is all here. Um, then we're gonna do this one, this is Cezanne. And when we deal with Cezanne, he is um, a post-impressionist as well. Um, and he is sort of like at the end of that post-impressionism um, and he becomes an influence for another uh, uh, actual, um, style of art uh, that we'll talk about in a couple of videos called cubism um, but you can also you can almost see the beginning of it like how this feels very geometric there's lots of like squarish sort of shapes so Cezanne um, a famous painter did a lot of still lifes um, and um, is actually probably really well known for um, his still lifes and some of his portraits. I'm going to scroll a little bit and show them to you. You may have seen something like this. You may have seen something like that. This is the card players. Um, it's one of the most expensive paintings to have ever been sold. Um, this is still life with oranges. And you're going to see that the when you look at the table, you're going to see that it's at what we often recall or refer to as a tilted perspective, an elevated perspective. Um, you it would be very difficult to actually stand and see this perspective without those oranges rolling off the table. Um, so the, it's less about what is actually there and more about the, the feel that you get. Um, the way that this is this is painted, um, it just couldn't exist. Those, those oranges would just slide right off the table, but we suspend our belief of that um, for the art. So, um, this is a, a work called Mont Sainte Victoire, um, and it is a mountain uh, in uh, a town called Aix en Provence. A I X is the first word, on E N Provence, P R O V E N C E. Um, and Aix en Provence is uh, Cezanne's hometown. It's the town he grew up in. Um, it's a huge huge, um, Mont Saint-Victoire is a huge presence in Aix-en-Provence. It's, it's, um, it's, it's just a commanding presence over the town because it's a giant mountain. Um, and what uh, Cezanne did was he bought a, a little plot of land on a hill sort of across a valley from Mont Saint-Victoire. And so where we are with this painting is we are um, at the, the house that Cezanne bought on the little hill across the valley from the mountain. So we're looking um, across, we see some houses, that's what that is, that's a house. There's another house, there's a house, and we sort of see a field and then we see the mountain. So we're up in the air um, because we're on a little hill and we're looking across the valley to another hill. Um, and Cezanne, also kind of was a little bit like Monet in the idea of, of what we call seriality, painting multiples of something in, in a series. Um, he, he painted over two dozen images of Mont Saint-Victoire, different times of the year, um, different focuses on either the houses or the mountain or whatever. Um, and this elevated perspective allowed him to sort of paint in what we used to call like they, they look like registers. I mean, look at what it looks like. It looks almost like an, uh, you know, one of the old um, Egyptian pieces or the standard of ore where it looks like it's broken into three pieces. One, this dark grassy area in front of us. Two, the field here. And three, the sky and the mountain. So it's like broken into these sort of three closest area, the three areas there. Um, our distance to the mountain is difficult to estimate in this particular um, work because we're becoming very much more impressionist. It again, it's an impression of this valley and the mountain. Um, and, and the mountain is 
it, it, we can tell that this is, oops, sorry. We can tell that this is the horizon line. We can tell that this is the mountain. We can tell that this is the sky and this is grass, but we're not, it's hard to tell our distance to the mountain um, because of, um, because of the perspective. Um, Cezanne liked to round edges. He liked to do geometrics. He liked to do juxtaposition of colors. And so what you see is, you know, some of the warm colors of the, 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 you know, the yellowy green and the orange, uh, in contrast with the, the cool colors, the blues and purples. And even the greens here, which are usually cool colors, um, this is like a brownie green that feels a little bit warm. So we have sort of this contrast of warm and cool colors. We have this contrast of, um, you know, near and far. We have, um, uh, we have a, a contrast between what feels um, very soft in some of these places with what feels very jagged, like the houses. Um, you know, we're looking at um, what will become, tuck this away in your, in your brain somewhere, we're looking at what will become cubism. I'm so sorry. We're looking at what will become um, a, another form of art, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and when we look at this piece, we're really thinking about um, how we can express uh, landscape, distance, color uh, in a different way. How we can um, look at, here are those houses, they're so cute and little and small, um, and how we can express um, a landscape, his landscapes almost never have people in them, by the way. Um, he was, you know, he would do people or he would do landscapes, but he rarely combined them. Um, and he really is about sort of the, the overall feeling that you get. Um, and he continues to practice with this concept of um, more geometric um forms, uh, squarer forms, triangular forms, um, and less uh, of the soft organics. Um, and, and he continues down this path towards abstraction. I mean, this is not abstract, but because something that is abstract means that it was never supposed to be something in particular, but this is abstracted. I mean, like, look at it. It's hard to, to make out some of the things. And that is really important. We're moving closer and closer and closer to, to what is um, non-representational, abstract. We're, we're becoming more and more and more abstracted. This is, you know, some of his work is more lifelike, right? But this is really moving away from things that are are more realistic and moving towards things that are much more impressionistic, much more abstracted. Um, and like I said, he's sort of the gateway to cubism. So keep that word in your head. Um, we're gonna do one more piece today. We're gonna do a work that is part of a, a, um, a art period called Fauvism. Uh, Fauve means wild beast. <laughs> Um, and these were um, a group of painters um, that painted uh, sort of in this wild style, um, crazy colors, uh, complementary colors um, that, that, you know, that, that make the eye go um, and sort of tension achieved through pattern and, 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 uh, contrast achieved through um, colors, um, and, and well, I'll just show you. Uh, so this is Matisse, um, uh, Henri Matisse. Uh, it is a, a piece called The Goldfish. Um, goldfish were introduced to Europe from Asia in, um, in the 17th century. Um, and um, interestingly, Matisse loved uh, to, to visit Morocco. And um, when he was in Morocco, he painted many, many patterns and many, many fish and many, many um, pieces that were influenced by, by Asian art. Um, and um, so what you see here really is uh, 
that wild beast idea. So we get the, the bright pattern of flowers and other flowers and more flowers that are in, you know, that are set off against the pattern in the table and the chair that is set off against the pattern that is created by the fish and their reflection. But realize that if, if you were looking at this, um, that tabletop is tilted towards you. Um, if you actually got this image of the fish, but that table, the, the fish would just fishbowl would just slide right off it. But we have the the patterned wallpaper, we have the flowers, we have leaves, we have the pattern in the chair, we have these bright, ridiculous colors. Um, we are given. Um, you know, we're given some of these bright reddish oranges with the light pastels, um, you know, bright, vibrant greens with then the, the grayish sort of top. Um, we also have the play of, you know, uh, complementary colors that, that make your eye pop, blue and orange, the, the blue chair and the orange fish, um, the green and red, the green chairs and the reddish orange. Like we have these, this makes our eye go, um, we have, it's very thinly applied color. It's not thick impasto, it's light, uh, lightly applied color, but it's very energetic. Um, and this comes from uh, his time in Morocco, looking at many of the cafes had fish and fish bowls on the, on the tables and he became fascinated with them. Um, and they were meant to, um, it, uh, cause or make you feel like uh, a state of tranquility, a calmness. Um, and he painted this after his trip to Morocco and after he moved out of Paris um, and he moved into a small town called Issy, I-S-S-Y, France. You probably don't need to know that because he felt like Paris was too busy and too crazy and too wild and too whatever. Um, and so um, he, this calmness that is that is supposed to come from these goldfish uh he has a room that is called a conservatory it's a room that's mostly glass um and it had a whole bunch of plants in it um and then he had this fish with a whole bunch of plants around them and it was like he was surrounded by glass in his conservatory and the fish were surrounded by glass um in in their bowl and uh he was surrounded by plants like the fish had plants and it was meant to sort of um encourage a sense of tranquility for himself. And he then uh, used that tranquility to then create the sort of tension in this space by changing the perspective and by contrasting those complementary colors next to each other. Um, this is his house. These are his plants. These are his fish. Um, and this is what his home looked like. But it's this idea of creating um, attention through pattern and space but also um, a way to be, um, to feel a sense of calm. And, and, and those, the tension and pattern in space, it gives your eye something to look at. But the overall image is, is calming. Um, uh, you can see the flowers here. You can see the fish. Um, it, it, it doesn't make you feel anxious. It, it gives your eye something to look at. That's what I mean about that tension. The eye is drawn to all of the juxtaposition of color and pattern, but the overall composition brings calmness. Um, these are some of uh, Matisse's other pieces. Um, again, here's that influence of pattern, uh, the wildness of color, um, and the, the juxtaposition of color here. Um, Matisse was a master um, of artwork and line and color and pattern. Um, and so that is the end of today's lesson. When I see you next time, we're going to do expressionism and surrealism. But I hope that you enjoyed um, our study of fauvism and um, post-impressionism, particularly um, my favorite guy in the whole world, Vincent van Gogh. Uh, he was an absolute genius, and um, I hope that you enjoyed learning about him, and I will see you next time. Bye, guys.